1 Samuel 17, and this morning what we're going to be doing is looking at the three ways God fights your battles for you. And my intent here is not to show you how you can stand up and how you can defeat the so-called giants in your life. I mean, that's where we've been told to go in this text. This is what you've heard preached, I'm sure, time and time again. You're supposed to be the hero, David or Zena, the warrior princess or whatever. And the idea is step one, you identify the giant in your life. And this can literally be anything from overcoming some kind of reoccurring sin addiction to making over a hundred grand so the hot girl in your Sunday school class will notice that you exist. You know, that's your, that's your giant. Step two, you go and do what no one else is willing to do, evidently, and that is to call out your giant, talk trash to it, and of course, all in the name of Jesus, there's no sense of pride or arrogance here, and uh, again, you're supposed to be the hero of your own story, and you identify yourself as David, and I don't know how you do this, you know, to, to get in this kind of mindset, maybe you look in the mirror or something, and you go, you know, I'm the man, I'm the man, you're just all this self-affirmation, You build your faith up. You build yourself up. I can take this thing on. Step three, you slay the giant. And again, it all depends on what giant you're facing that week. Maybe you disconnect from the internet for obvious reasons, or you throw away your cell phone, or maybe you finally man up and ask some girl on a date, or whatever it is that your giant is. And so where does this get you? Typically, when you look at the account of David and Goliath, Uh, with this hero, uh, you know, kind of mentality. I'm the hero, this is my sin, this is my giant. Typically, when we look at this text in that way, here's what happens. Nothing. Nothing at all. Maybe during the, the... the hour of the sermon, you might resolve yourself to no longer let that sin slap you around anymore. You might make some promises, a couple of ill-advised vows, but at the end of the day, literally, nothing really changes in your life. You're moved for a moment. It's like watching, you know, the gladiator, and now you want to go and be big and bad, and, but it doesn't last, and your giant remains, and it still is taking you out on a very regular basis. Why is that? It's due primarily to the fact that 1 Samuel 17 isn't about us. It isn't about you fighting your giants. And I don't care how many times you've heard it preached that way. That's not what this text is about. Rather, this text is about God fighting your greatest battle, singular, on your behalf. And so that's my purpose, to enable you to trust that God has fought and has won the battle you could never win, because that's what this text is really about. So let's get started as we look at these three ways God has fought your battle for you. Here's the first one. God fights, first of all, the battle you cannot win. And we're going to see this uh, within the context of verses 1 through 11, 1 Samuel 17. And let's start by looking at verses 1 and 3. And here we're going to simply look at the background of the enemy, the Philistines as a whole. Look at what it says, verses 1 through 3. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Succoth, uh, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between uh, Soko and Azekah in Ephes Daman. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered, encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley in between them. So the the Philistines were a group of people living within the promised land of Canaan. A people, by the way, that God had commanded Israel to remove from the land. And so that didn't happen. And so... Here they are, squared off, Israel, the people of God, versus these pagans, the Philistines. Now, there are several reasons beyond their lack of faith in God, because they weren't trusting him to go forth and fight on their behalf, especially now in light of the fact that they're the ones that said, hey, we no longer need judges, we no longer really need you, give us a king. They were trusting in Saul. And so they, there's reasons beyond their lack of faith in God that made it all but impossible for Israel to push the Philistines out of Canaan. For starters, the Philistines had some serious military tech. Tech that the Israelites couldn't compete with ever. 
For instance, they were one of the first of the ancient civilizations to master the production of bronze and iron. And that's what their armor, that's what their weapons were made of. Whereas the Israelites were running around with slings and wooden staves, a couple of bows and arrows, and the rare, occasional iron sword. It would be like showing up to a knife fight, you know, or rather to a gunfight with a knife. It just wasn't fair. Then, of course, there was their chariots, the Philistine chariots, which were famous. Uh, the Philistine chariot was like the tank of ancient times. You put two horses in front of an armored platform, you put two or three javelin-throwing warriors in the back, and you had an instant and overwhelming military advantage. Furthermore, the Philistines live along, lived along the coast, which at the time, the southern coast of Israel, uh, which at the time was the most used trade route in the world. As a result, the Philistines became extremely wealthy because if you were, say, in North Africa and Egypt or what have you, you had to go through them to get your goods to the rest of the world, to the rest of the Middle East at least. End of story. And so they were going to either rob you or exhort some money out of you. And so they were really good militarily. They had wealth. This combination, wealth, military might, made them a formidable enemy. An enemy that up to this point was for all intents and purposes undefeatable. And this is who Israel is squared off against. And they even knew it. We don't have the experience. We don't have the military technology. We don't have the wealth. But we have Saul. Never mind God, but we're going to go for it. And now then look at verses 4 through 8. Because here we get our first glimpse of the Philistine juggernaut, Goliath. Look at how he's geared up and ready to roll. Verse 4. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. By the way, real quickly, some have estimated that Goliath, based on this, is over nine feet tall. And, and you know, perhaps he was. But it was probably more like seven foot something give or take a few span or, you know, inches, whatever. The point is this, and this is what Samuel is trying to emphasize. It's not about, like, necessarily precision, you know, like nine foot something. It's this idea. He was giant in comparison to David. In fact, in comparison to any man of Israel. He was physically intimidating. And it really doesn't matter if he was nine foot something or seven foot tall, especially in the light of the fact that the average Israelite probably maxed out, like a tall Israelite was probably five foot eight, maybe five foot nine. Saul, he was going to be one of the biggest, baddest guys in the army. And he probably wasn't near six foot tall. Add to this that David was still young perhaps even a teenager. He hadn't even finished growing as of yet. And now we have this young, inexperienced shepherd boy, five foot nothing, facing off with a seasoned soldier close to seven foot tall. That's intimidating. It doesn't add up. You don't match those guys up together to go fight. And as if that were not enough, notice what Goliath brought to the show. It's not just his physical presence it's all this military might as well. Look at verses 5 through 7. This giant of a man, he had a helmet of bronze on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had, a, he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of, bron of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like, the weaver, like a weaver's be beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and his uh, shield bearer went before him. So he was a human tank, right? Not only was he physically scary to look at, but he was also rendered basically untouchable by what amounted to approximately 125 pounds worth of bronze armor and his own personal bodyguard, a shield bearer, to boot, to go before him. I mean, how do you even get to this guy to defeat him? That would have been the first question, right? Let alone like, okay, so if he pulls a sword or he throws the javelin, I'm going to die. But even if I get the free, like if he tells me, take your best shot, what am I going to do? 
Nothing. You know, it's not a video game. You get one shot and then he's going to come and kill you. And that's what's going through the mind of Saul and the army as they're looking at this imposing guy day in and day out as he comes down. No wonder Saul and the entire army just kind of stood there in fear. I mean, what are you going to do? Other than take one for the team and die. That's it. That's really all that they see coming at them. And of course, it doesn't end there. Goliath, not only was he scary to look at, had all of this imposing, uh, just you know, intimidating armament and, you know, weapons and what have you, but he talked crazy trash. You know, sometimes when you're a big guy and scary, you don't have to say nothing. You're just scary. Goliath did everything. He was the Conor McGregor of his own time, although he gets stomped out from time to time. This guy wasn't. He was the champion for a reason. He talked trash. He could back it up, and he was willing to go there. And so he was the master of psychological warfare, and that's what was going on here in the midst of this valley. Look at verses 8 through 11, and you see it. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? In other words, why are you even wasting your time? Why are you even here? Let's just settle this as he's about to say, you know, man to man. Instead of us murdering the whole lot of you, let's just just do this one-on-one, it's real quick, real simple, and then we'll decide from there. And so he goes on, am I not a Philistine? Again, going back to the fact these are the Philistines, the wealthiest, most experienced, most technically advanced military the world knows. Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? You know, who's Saul? That's what he's saying. Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So that's pretty self-explanatory, right? He basically told them, we can save time and needless bloodshed. Just send out your best warrior. We'll get this thing done. And some of you will get to live as a result of that and be our slaves. That's what he's emphasizing. If you win and you won't, we'll serve you. Blah, ha, ha. But if I squash your best warrior like a bug, then you're going to serve us. That's the options. How did Israel respond? Look at verse 11. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed, greatly afraid. They were to a man paralyzed by fear. They knew, every last one of them knew this, Goliath cannot be defeated. You see, When we twist this verse around, when we twist this text around and turn it into, well, I'm David and, you know, my addiction or this thing that I want so bad that stands in front of me like this giant mountain of a person, if if I can just get everything together and trust God enough, I can beat him, I can kill him, I can defeat him, hang his head in my tent, blah, blah, blah. If I can just do, when we twist it to turn ourselves into the hero, we're missing something very important, and it's this. All of Israel, including Saul, looked at Goliath and went, he cannot be defeated. And it's not just simply a matter of faith. The emphasis here is that Goliath represented something even to the people of God, even in their lack of faith, and they were lacking faith. Yes, an undefeatable enemy. What this means is that your greatest enemy is not what you think it is. Your greatest enemy is not your addiction, as horrible as it may be. It's not your broken relationship, marriage or otherwise, and you know you want to get your mind around it and overcome it like David did Goliath. It's not you facing unemployment and how you're going to take care of your family, as devastating as that is. All of these, by comparison to this great enemy that we're going to unpack here in a moment, are small, insignificant in comparison. I'm not saying that they don't hurt you or that God doesn't care, but these are not the Goliaths of your life. 
that undefeatable enemy. I mean, think about it. You go right, you go to the right treatment center, believe it or not, you can learn some life skills, believe it or not, and you can overcome your addiction. You get the right counseling, Christian or not, you can learn some things, communication skills and how to forgive, and you can put your relationship back together. You hand out enough applications, you're eventually going to land a job somewhere. And God can and he will help you in all of those little battles. So then here's the question. If these are not the Goliaths that you're facing, then what is? If these are not the great substantial battles of your lifetime, then what constitutes this this great battle? It's real simple. The Goliath, the giant that you cannot defeat ever, ever, is sin and death. When it comes to this real giant, Sin that you all have and I have and its consequence, eternal death. You don't stand a chance. You are going to get stomped out every time by yourself. And this is why David stood before Goliath and he said all the way down in verse 47, the battle, this battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. In other words, I can't do this. David didn't go out there going, You know, I got this. Give me a rock. I'm going to hit him in the head. End of story. His confidence was in the fact that you can't, they can't, my brothers can't. I really can't either. But God can. I'm just going to be the instrument for it. And this is an undefeatable enemy, but God's got this. Because why? God is God. This is why David stood there in front of him. Look, there are two references in the book of Romans that prove this point. One of them, you can turn there with me, is Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. Classic text, I've read it a lot, and I do so often because I want us to understand the power that sin has over us and the power necessary that is beyond us to defeat it, to overcome it, and that comes only from God. Look at what it says, Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, what then? Are Jews any better off than Gentiles, non-Jews? And he says, no, not at all, for we have already charged that all, and that what he means by that is Jews, non-Jews, everybody for all time, this is your condition. All, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin. That word under, I mean, it's just like squashed like a bug. You are never going to be good enough. You are never going to be able to do battle with sin that dominates you. You're never going to be able to stand in front of it and honestly say, I will never give in to your temptations. I will never sin again. You're going to. You're going to sin in thought, in word, and in deed on a daily basis. Why? Because it owns you. That's it. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew and you have close proximity to the word of God during the time that this was written in the first century. It doesn't matter if you're a Greek, a Gentile, and you're still worshiping Zeus. It doesn't matter. Regardless, you're under the power of sin and it dominates you. You are a slave to sin. You're just a little kid standing in front of a giant of a man and he says, you're gonna do what I tell you. You just go, yes, sir. And then it tells us, Verse 10, as it is written, none is righteous. What that means is that not this self-righteous, hey, I'm better than you, but rather righteous in the sense of don't compare yourself to the way you were yesterday. Don't compare yourself to, the, to your neighbor, but compare yourself to the perfections of God. And none of us are righteous because God is perfectly sinless, meaning perfectly righteous. And so he says right there, none are righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. And you know, we're so pretentious. We want to think, well, I'm here, aren't I? I'm seeking God. I'm seeking answers. No. Not according to Scripture. Not according to what I just read. 
Because you know what that gives you is this inclination, this, this tiny bit of hope. There's just enough good in me and the proof is seen in the fact that I'm quote unquote spiritual and therefore I stand a chance against sin and death. It might be minute, but according to my own significant power, somehow, some way, I'm going to defeat that giant of sin and death. And he's like, you don't even understand what you're up against. This power that you are under, sin. And you don't even understand who God is. You're not really seeking him. What you're doing in your pretentious, supposed spiritual endeavors is this. You are looking for a God, small g, that you can approach on your own terms. You're not seeking the one true God. You're seeking a little God that you can form and manipulate and call your own. And so he's saying, there's no one who understands, there's no one who seeks for the one true and living God. All have turned aside. Together, they have become worthless. No one does good, no, not even one. The point is this. You can never be good enough. You're not strong enough to resist this enemy because it's not only about sin, but then it's also its consequences. Sin stands in front of you like this armored giant and you're just a little boy, a little girl standing in front of it and you're defenseless. And then he pulls his sword and swings. What is that? According to Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin which dominates you and you are all under the power of, the wages of sin is death. Not just, you know, six foot in the grave, but time and eternity in hell. That's the kind of death that he's talking about. These are the enemies that you cannot defeat. Look, if you have not repented of your sins, and trusted exclusively in Christ alone for your salvation, then you're standing in front of a giant on the verge of getting decimated. You can't win this battle. You don't get to walk away from this one and live to fight another day. You lose this fight. You spend an eternity in hell. And some of you are losing this fight. You're maybe even aware of it. Like, look, I, I know that sin is bad and I'm doing my best. That's why I'm here at church. I'm going to read these verses. I'm going to repeat this prayer. I'm going to give a little money. And, and you're, what you're trying to do is, is fight a battle that you cannot win. You're, try, you're trying to be good so that someday you get to go to heaven. That's the war that is being waged. You're going to lose because you're just a little boy or a little girl standing in front of a giant called sin and death that owns you. And someday he's going to swing that sword and you're going to spend an eternity in hell. I can't emphasize this enough. You lose this fight every time. So you've got to make a decision right here now. Are you going to go at this giant of sin and death all by your onesies or are you going to trust in Christ and let him fight this battle for you? You either go solo and lose every time. Even solo in the sense of, I'm going to be religious. You're going to go solo and fight that fight by yourself and lose every time. Or you look at sin and death and say along with David, uh, this battle belongs to the Lord. I can't do this. That's what you need to do. And so God fights the battle that you cannot possibly win. Secondly, God fights your battle in the most unexpected ways. So now looking back at our text, 1 Samuel 17, I want to ask the following question before we start tearing into some verses, but bear in mind the armies of Israel and the Philistines, they've drawn up battle lines. And then, of course, the one-man army named Goliath, he goes down to the valley floor, he talks trash about God and Israel, and he has no takers whatsoever for a one-on-one. -on -one. With that in mind, who should we have expected to fight this battle? How about David's brother? Or, or at least his, or his brothers, you know, but at least his oldest brother, because that's who's emphasized here. Look at verses 12 and 13. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite, 
of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. Let's just focus on Eliab. He's the oldest of uh, Jesse's eight sons. He's the one the prophet Samuel thought for sure, just based on his outward appearances, he thought for sure that Eliab was God's anointed, going to be the next king. He's a grown man, evidently somewhat of an experienced soldier. Shouldn't he be the one that's ready to go throw down with Goliath? Not so much. He just stands there, like everybody else. So before we nominate Eliab for the Pansy's Hall of Shame, let's take a quick look at the rest of Israel's army. How did they stand up, including its king and military leader, Saul? Look down at verse 11. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistines, uh, they were, or rather the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And so this was as good as it gets. These are really the men you would expect to go for it. The best Israel had to offer, and not of one of them, including the tall, handsome, and hey, my daddy owns a bunch of sheep, so I'm wealthy King Saul. None of them had the stomach to go fight Goliath. So what happens when your best, your strongest, turn out to be a bunch of wimps? What does God do when his people are faced with an unwinnable situation? Enter the sheep herder. Y'all get that right, not enter the dragon, Bruce, never mind. Anyway, David is described for us here in verses 14 through 20. And yeah, he was just a boy and he was just a sheep herder. And look at what it says about him. David was the youngest. And so again, perhaps just a teenage boy. And he's about to enter into this horrific scene of battle. And that's something that shouldn't be lost on us. Let's say Goliath's not even there. This is still a horrific place for a young boy to be, right? The carnage, people that he knows and loves being decimated in front of him, his nation, who he has so many aspirations for, the enemy that he's been raised to fear and knows how powerful they are, and now he's in close proximity. This should have been a very terrifying scene for him. And... But on top of all of this is this giant, Goliath, defying Israel's armies, defying the God whom he loved. Look at what it says. He was the youngest. The three three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistine came forward, took his stand morning and evening, um, and Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers and take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment and as the host was going out to the battle line shouting the war cry. So here's what we've got. David's the youngest. He's the most inexperienced, the most physically non-intimidating son of Jesse. If he would have had a, you know, a yearbook, he would have been voted most least likely to fistfight a giant Philistine. You know, this isn't the guy you choose. And yet here he was. You know, I've wondered about this. Why didn't God send Eliab? the man that even the prophet Samuel had looked at and said, that's the guy, this guy's the next king. He's tall, he's handsome, he'll get it done. Why didn't one of the more seasoned soldiers meet Goliath in the valley? And for goodness sakes, why didn't King Saul lace up his armor, grab his sword, and defend the honor of God and Israel? Let me suggest this. And it's found in Hebrews eleven six, 6. And you don't have to turn there. I'm just paraphrasing it a bit. Let me suggest this reason for the lack of honor and a willingness to fight on behalf of the people you would expect. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, 
it is impossible to please God. For David, the young, unassuming shepherd boy, for him to go and do what no military man of Israel was willing to do, required an unshakable faith, not in his own abilities, because he had none by comparison, but rather faith in the immeasurable and inexhaustible power of God to vanquish his foe. That's who he had faith in that day. And by the way, this points directly, not to yourself, like, hey, whatever problem I'm facing, if I just muster up enough faith, God's going to step in and knock it down. That's not what this is telling you to do. You, again, are not the hero of this story. This points directly to Christ and not yourself. You see, your greatest battle, the giant you're facing, is again sin and death. And your only hope is found not in trusting in yourself to keep a list of rules and somehow get God to like you enough to let you go into heaven. You can't do that. Sin and death is a giant you're going to lose every time. Your only hope, much like David's only hope that day, was in putting his faith, his trust in God and his power to win the battle. Your only hope is by putting your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ who has won the battle already. Now then read along with me real quickly verses 21 through 27 because this sets something up for us here. Look at how this plays out. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle army against army. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. You can just imagine this kid showing up. You're sitting there staring as a grown man. This battle is about to ensue in front of you. Goliath's about to do his thing again. And your punk brother shows up and goes, hey, how's it going? What's going on? You know, there's a reason they were mad at him. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines. He spoke the same words as before, talking trash. David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Of course, how could you possibly miss him? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. Now then, pay close attention right here. In verse 25, and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches, will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him the same way. You know, it's like, what did I just tell you? You know, so it shall be done to the man who kills him. Now then, some folks would want us to question David's motives at this juncture. For daring to stand up to Goliath, especially in light of verse 25, because here we find the reward King Saul offers for the man who kills Goliath. The king will enrich the man who kills him, With great riches, he will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So there's the author. Wealth, marriage into the royal family, tax exemption. That's what is meant by make his family free. Tax exemption for the entire family. That's a big deal. In other words, if you won't do it, and no man would up to this point, if you won't do it for God and country, do it for the money, do it for the hot chick, or at least for your family so that they can live in relative ease from now on. Let me give you some other incentives. That's what King Saul was doing. In fact, he never even mentioned, let's do this one for God. Let's trust him and run into battle. That was never even thought of. Money, women, your family, do it for them. You know, in verse 26, David does, in fact, he asks the question, hey, what's the reward for slaying said giant? But you know what? This doesn't necessarily tell us why David squared off with Goliath. Like, okay, he asked the question. That must mean he was in it for the money, for the girl, and for his family. It doesn't even say that. What it does, in fact, is serve as an indictment of the absolute cowardice of those you would have expected to fight Goliath in the first place. 
None of them were willing to step into the ring, not for money, not for women, not for family, and especially not for God. It's interesting, our own motives, right? For being religious, for fighting Goliath, for fighting sin and death by ourselves through religion. What are our motives? Our motive is always this, to save our own skin. It's the only reason we're in the ring. Why do you do quote-unquote good things? This is so important. Well, I, I try to be a good person because someday I'm going to stand before God and He's going to judge me and He's going to ask me, why should you go to heaven? And your answer, if you're fighting this battle alone, your answer is always going to be this. Well, I believe that there's a God, so I, I have that going for me. And I, um, I'm basically a good person. I've tried to be a good person. Here's my list. Uh, you know, I'd go to church on occasion. I would do this. I would do that. You're going you're gonna to defend yourself. You're going to fight this battle with all these really paper things, you know. And God, just like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Sermon on the Mount, at the end of that sermon, he said, some of you are going to come in front of me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I cast out demons? Didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I do good things in my life? And he's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. In other words, everything you did, they may have been good. Casting out demons, probably a good thing. Prophesying, great. By the way, he meant preaching. That's a good thing, should be a good thing. But when you do it for the wrong motive, to save yourself, then it's worthless. Then you don't, he doesn't even know, I don't even know you. What are you talking about? I didn't make a room for you. I made a room for people that know me, which is far different than people that try to use me to get in. So are you fighting alone or are you trusting in Christ? Do you, do you guys see what I'm talking about? It's all about your motive. And again, this all points forward to Christ. The Jews, for instance, never expected God to send someone like Jesus to fight their battle for them. In fact, in their mind, their greatest enemy during Jesus' lifetime, their greatest enemy was not sin and death. Hey, we've got that one. Don't, don't preach to us. Their greatest enemy was the occupying forces of the Roman legion. And so they expected a dynamic warrior king that would lead them to decimate their earthly enemies. And we may not be occupied by an opposing enemy, but I would dare say that most of us are preoccupied with imaginary monsters we confuse with giants. And so instead of looking to the true Jesus revealed in Scripture, the unexpected one who faced our true giant, sin and death, instead of looking to Christ, we look to a Jesus with a small j of our own imaginations fighting our imaginary giants. Jesus, if you will just allow me to have this much money, my life will be great. That's my greatest obstacle. No, it's not. You're going to die without that treasure. It's all subject to moth. Moths and rust. You don't get to take it with you. It's not a giant. And so some of us are preoccupied with these imaginary battles, these imaginary giants, and there's nothing to them. And so you pray to a Jesus of your own, imaginary, uh, your own imagination. You're begging him to allow you to make more money, to score the right girl, right do, or whatever it is you're into. And Saul did much the same thing by offering David his armor and his sword. Back in verses 38 and 39, he gave them all this stuff. He had them put it on. It, it didn't fit. It didn't work. These were, if you will, the armor and the weapons of the world of man trying to take on sin and death, your religion, your so-called good works that are going to get you into heaven. Many of you here are aware that your greatest enemy is, is sin and death. Even so, you fight them with this man -made, these man-made weapons of a sincere heart and my all-time favorite, I'm a good person. You expect to gain entrance into the presence of God. You expect to be saved by your works. This despite the fact that Scripture clearly tells us that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's found in Acts 15, 11. 
And you know, you can have that Jesus of your own imagination if you want. But that little Jesus is not the Lord and Savior revealed throughout Scripture. He is the unexpected one who lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, rose from the grave, defeating your greatest enemy, sin and death. And the best description of him and how he's so unexpected is found in Isaiah 53, 1 through 5. Let me read that for you. Who has believed what they have heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, meaning Jesus, pointing to Jesus, grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. There was nothing spectacular about him. Like, that guy's tall and handsome and good looking. He'll lead us into battle and blah, blah, blah. That's how Samuel and Israel looked to King Saul and Eliab, they look to him as an imposing thing. But Jesus, he's nothing to look at. No form or majesty that we should look at him. And no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't good looking like we have it in our heads. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And so it's the exact opposite. Like the dude you would think would go and fight on your behalf, some giant standing, the the ugly, short, little guy, the one that shouldn't be fighting the fight, that's the guy. Jesus, who fought your greatest battle over sin and death. You know, it's not like Arnold Schwarzenegger walked into the scene. No. We saw what he was described like. Nothing, like a worm. Not only to be ignored, but even to be despised, like pfft. I can't do it, man. No way. Yet in verse 4 and 5, it says, he, born, he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. This is the guy that has taken on everything that's ever wounded you. Your greatest defeats, your greatest wounds, the one that you would never expect said, I got that. I can handle that. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, He took all of our deepest wounds and defeats. He said, these belong to me, and we look at him and say, eh, so what? Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. So this Jesus, who we would never choose to go and fight this battle against sin and death, that we would rather fight this battle with our own good works, this one that's so unexpected, he's the one that took all of your sin and said, this belongs to me. God, his Father, disciplined him, killed him for your sins, and the victory is won in him. All you have to do is believe it. And the victory is yours. Now then, lastly, God fights your battle decisively, very quickly. David's victory over Goliath was decisive. It was quick. And it was final. Look at verse 48, 1 Samuel 17. When the Philistine arose and he came and he drew near to meet David, David, I love this ran quickly towards the battle. It wasn't none of this like, man, am I really doing this? This is going down, you know, and, he's, and his brothers are pushing him like, go for it, tax free, you know, whatever. None of this. He ran. And again, he's not running because like, hey, I got this, you know, self-confidence that we are so addicted to today. He ran because he'd already said it. This battle is God's. He's gonna give you to me. Your head, mine because of God. So he ran towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in the bag and he took out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell to his face on the ground. Probably the only place where he was unarmored. You know, he had the helmet and, uh, you know, there had to be some kind of thing where he could see. And so wherever that little chink in the armor, that's where God placed the stone. So David prevailed over the Philistine with the, with the sling and with the stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran. He stood over the Philistine. And by the way, I can just imagine the battle lines. Everybody knew the outcome. 
David's going to die. You know, I'm going to be, I don't know, herding sheep for a Philistine before it's all said and done. My wife's going to belong to, you know, some guy like Goliath, you know, so it's done. It's a done deal. And they, I guess they were just resigned to it. Could you imagine the stunned silence when David, with one fell swoop, like, okay, let's do this. He runs, well, boom, bang, and he's still just trusting in the Lord, and now he's going to just finish it. He prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. He struck the Philistine and killed him. Then skip down to verse 54. David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. By the way, I missed a part, the most graphic part. He ran, he stood over the Philistine, verse 51, and he took the Philistine's sword, he drew it out of its sheath, and he killed him. He was already dead, hit him with the stone, but he cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And then, as just as to put an exclamation mark on it, David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. And he put his armor in his tent. So, was there any doubt as to who won the fight? This one didn't go to decision, right? Like, well, who did you think won? You know, I thought David got the best of it. No. He had his head hanging in Jerusalem. And this is the same thing that Christ's victory over sin and death looked like. Complete, final, no question, no doubt whatsoever. Done deal on the cross, not as a result of your performance afterwards. Make sure you get that. The victory that you and I now enjoy as Christians over sin and death was accomplished not after you prayed a prayer and then, you know, like, well, I'm, I'm more good today than I am bad, so I must be going to heaven because the victory is mine because I did it, because I'm David, and I overcame that. Ju- no, that's not it. That's complete nonsense. That's not even the gospel. That kind of belief system will send you to hell. But when you look at the cross and you go, that was it. That's when the victory was won. And yes, in my life, here and now, I'm going to have sinful thoughts. Stupid, sinful things are going to come out of my mouth. I'm going to walk in sinful ways. But that doesn't, that does not weaken the power of the cross. Do you guys get that? And here's why. In this one, I want you to turn to. They may not show it, but it's John 19.30. Look at what happens here. This is on the cross. Some of the last words that our Lord uttered. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, and here it is, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. So just before he dies, those three words come out of his mouth. It is finished. What did he mean by that? He meant the victory is won. The ultimate defeat of sin and death, your giant that you cannot defeat. It is complete. It is finished. There's no more battles in your life. The war is over. Colossians 2, 13 through 15 emphasizes this as well. Beginning in verse 13, it says, In you, so this is us, you and me, who were dead in your trespasses. I mean, can you defend yourself? Can you go fight Goliath? No. You were dead in your trespasses. Your sin, your giant sin, has already killed you, slayed you. And the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. How? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. The legal demand of sin is death, eternal death. This he set aside, how? Nailing it to the cross. Boom. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, when he uttered those words, it is finished. What it means is that the battle was and is over. It goes on, it even says, verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities. He put them to open shame, like David cutting off the head of Goliath and saying, battle's over, man, done. 
How? By triumphing over them. How did Jesus triumph over our greatest enemy? What was that I've got Goliath's head moment for Jesus when he fought on our behalf? The moment he died on the cross. It is finished. I got this. Bringing it all together, God fought the battle you could not win over sin and death. He sent the most unexpected person to fight for you, his very own son. And lastly, Jesus defeated your greatest enemy, sin and death, once and for all by dying on the cross for your sins, rising from the grave that you might have eternal life. And so here's my final question. Clearly God has fought and won this battle for countless sinners, but the question is this. Has he defeated sin and death for you through his son? Or are you standing in front of Goliath all by yourself on the verge of spending an eternity in hell? Here's how you can tell. Have you repented of your sins? Have you trusted not in yourself, your own goodness, but exclusively in who Jesus is, both man and God? And have you trusted in what he's done for you? He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. It is finished. He rose from the grave. If you have done that, the war is over. If you have not done that, you are about to get stomped out and spend an eternity in hell. Which one is it for you? Let's pray. Father, we see clearly now this picture, not of our own strength or even our own capacity to somehow have faith and overcome challenges in life. It's not what this message is about. It's never been about that. We see clearly our enemy, sin and death, and how we could never, ever overcome them. We see clearly now how you sent your son. Even though he just doesn't look right in our eyes like a champion. He wasn't beautiful to look at, in fact, despised by men. But he's the one that went to the cross and delivered the final blow on our behalf. It is finished. The war is over. I pray for your people right now that they would stand in that, in the sufficiency of that grace, that gift of Jesus fighting for us and winning decisively. And I pray for those here this morning that are lost and are on the verge of spending an eternity in hell, that you would break them and allow them to see Christ as your soldier who fought on our behalf and for their salvation. Break them so that they might be saved. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen.